Yep, okay, great, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a very warm welcome to each and every one of you from wherever you may be joining us from around the world. And welcome to this, the first in the WASA, that's the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums Sustainability Series of Webinars. It's wonderful to have you all with us as we start off the, the journey on sustainability. Now, my name is Dr. Judy Man Lang, and I work for the South African Association for Marine Biological Research, or SAMBRA, which is also known as Ashaka Sea World. And I'm coming to you from the KwaZulu Natal province in South Africa. And I'm also representing the International Zoo Educators Association, the IZE. I see that. In the chat, we have people from literally around the world. And, and it's just amazing to see how many, over 50 of you have joined us to talk about something that is really important and, and close to all of our hearts. Over the last few years, the WASDA community has really embraced sustainability. And we've produced a number of different resources through the WASDA community. And these resources have covered things like plastics, forestry, um, all sorts of different areas of sustainability. And we decided last year that we would put together a series of webinars, which really showcases the different guides that we've put together. And today, because it's July and it's Plastic Free July, we thought it was appropriate to do the first webinar on the guide that we launched last year called the Short Guide on How to Reduce Single-Use Plastic at Your Zoo or Aquarium. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask Gav to put up the poll because it will be really useful for us to find out just how many of you have seen the guide and how many of you use the guide. So we'll just do a couple of seconds to, to have a look at that if we can just answer the poll. So the first question, have you seen the WASA short guide, how to reduce single use plastic at your zoo or aquarium? And the second question. This one where it's a little bit harder. Have you used the short guide? And I think many people might might be ticking the third one. And I'm hopefully hopefully a lot of ticking the they have used it. Okay, if everyone has responded to the, the poll, Gav, can you give us the results, please? Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so, are you seeing them? Sorry? Are you, sorry, are you able to see the results? Because I'm seeing just 0%, which is weird. I can see them. Can everybody else see them? Yes? Yeah. So 58%, the majority say they plan to use it, 29% uh, say no, and 14% say they have used it. So that's actually a wonderful starting point for us, because if you're at that planning stage, this is just the webinar for you, because what we've done is we've gathered together a group of amazing speakers who are going to share with us their journey on single use plastic. And I think that often it's quite hard to take that first step. So they're going to show us what they've done. We've got people from all over the world on our panel and we've got people from aquariums and zoos, from big facilities and small facilities to really share their stories with us. So I'm just going to welcome our entire panel. So firstly, we've got anne Katrin gone and she's from Copenhagen Zoo in Denmark. Then we've got Helen Lockhart. She's from the Two Oceans Aquarium in South Africa. After that, we're going to have Marcus Tay from Wildlife Reserve Singapore. And then Renee Bumpers from Houston Zoo in the USA. And last but not least, we have Wolfgang Rades from Loro Park in Tenerife. So we've got a wonderful group and a very, very big thank you to each of our panelists. I mentioned earlier when we were just chatting that this has been the easiest webinar to arrange because everyone said, 
take me, I'm keen, I'll share my story. And that really is amazing. So thank you very much to each of our panelists and a very big thank you to Gabrielle um, from the WASA office for all the organizing for this webinar. So thank you very much to everybody. Right, I think that you've heard enough from me. So over to our first panelist and Katrine, will you share your slide and uh, take over? Yes, I will try to, let me see. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, all perfect. Um, and just very quickly to, to interrupt, we will have hopefully time for a few questions at the end. So we'll do questions at the end. Thank you. And Katrine, over to you. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Judy. So I'm Anne Katrine and I'm based at Copenhagen Zoo in Denmark at the Department of Conservation. Um, we have been working with facing out single use plastic for um, a few years. Um, the onset started in 2018 when the EU um, launched their plastic st strategy um, and they would start banning some single use products already from 2020. So we at the zoo thought we had to do something because of course we had unfortunately uh, many single use plastic products in our zoo. So um, we started uh, from the onset that the EU also used, and that was to look at the 10 common products found, plastic uh, products found on European beaches, which are these ones that you can see here on the screen. Uh, we haven't been focusing on all of them here at the zoo, but we chose to um, look at these eight uh, items. And um, these are probably items that other zoos will have been looking at, uh, at as well. But we added one um, other product, which is the uh, disposable gloves, which we also use a lot, um, especially when there is a, a risk of infection um, where we can't face them out. But we had a really good project with uh, the plastic gloves. So what did we do? We started off by looking at some of the things that we had been buying in 2017. And we had a lot of single use gloves bought in. Uh, we used in 2017, 2,075,000 gloves. That's a lot. And that equals the border between Denmark and Germany. That's 68 kilometers. That's a lot. We also purchased 60,000 disposable disc cloths um, and they fill up the area of a football pitch. So that's also a lot and 64,000 sets of single use cutlery. That's about 30 times uh, the Eiffel Tower. So we knew this was not good and we had to do something. So uh, we started to map out uh, all the items that we had and we, ha we looked at what could we uh, start off easily facing out. And the easy products were these ones because we could fin find alternatives. Um, so we worked through 18 to 19, and this is all, it kind of ended at, um, at the end of 2019 because then we hit uh, COVID in 2020. So everything I'm telling you today is um, pre-COVID, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about it. But we managed to face out um, cutlery, plates, straws, um, disposable dish, dish cloths and plastic bags. That was not uh, that big a problem. And we could um, use other type of products, for example, bamboo products um, to replace the plastic ones. But what we also do did, we also reduced the amount that we used. Um, the, um, the products that were slightly more difficult to um, eliminate completely are uh, especially cups and, and uh, food wrapping the plastic gloves because there are infection risks so you have to use some type of plastic gloves uh, plas plastic bottles we managed to face out all the plastic bottles that were used internally so we always use uh, jugs uh, at meetings or at functions as well um, but out in the zoo when people buy their water we haven't managed to completely face out plastic bottles um, but the big star story for us was really um, the plastic gloves because our keepers went into this and really wanted to find solutions. And it's always best when you can work as a, as a whole team and everyone wants to participate. And here we found 
reusable gloves that we could use for several months and and that really reduced the amount of plastic gloves gloves that we uh, that we used so um we've all been asked in a panel to to um, talk about things we wish we had known um finding alternatives is not as easy as you might think it might be easier now than it was in 2018 and 19 but it's not easy and it's also very time consuming. There's also um, an economic factor in it. Um, so it's not as easy as, as you would think. And we particularly had problems with balloon stick holders, not easy to find an alternative. The same with the slush ice cups or straws for hot beverages. There are straws for hot beverages, but they disintegrate quite quickly. So that's still, you know, I'm sure someone will find a solution, but, but there are um, difficulties. Um, also, another challenge we kind of had was with the external stores, because you have to make sure that you constantly give them uh, information flow and also keep on nursing them about what the zoo wants to um, reduce and what the zoo stands for environmentally. So you have to constantly have uh, a flow with your external stores if you have uh, them in your zoo. And then we have the COVID-19, which stopped everything. And suddenly there was lots of plastic products, uh, disposable plastic, plastic products that had to be used. The mask, we brought in lots of masks and more disposable um, gloves. So that was, of course, a big challenge. And I wish we had known and we could have found alternatives back then. But we, of course, didn't know like the rest of you. But all is not bad. And we have not forgotten our plastic initiative. And we are um, continuing now in 2021 um, and we are continuing with recording um, the amounts that we are we're buying we have to go a little bit back but we we are started again and and to kind of get the whole team everyone in the zoo involved we have started with introducing the bin challenge because funny enough we have many bins in the offices in the zoo why do we need all these bins so we have decided that we're doing a binge challenge trying to get all the different buildings in the zoo to reduce the amount of bins so they only have one in in, in the uh, in the offices and then when you when you reduce your amount of bins you'll reduce the plastic bags you'll help the cleaners they don't have to carry or go to so many places and also you'll get your personal exercise because you have to get off your chair and go and throw out your, your waste. So it's all a win-win-win situation. So, but we're also thinking about other things besides from plastic. We also look at the SDGs from um, the UN, the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. We, are, we have policies on the wood that we're using. Uh, we're also um, writing now a policy on palm oil. I know other zoos have been very, um, um, well, in front, at the forefront with the palm oil, but we're also working on that as well as on soya. So we are thinking in many different directions. And of course, plastic was a very good start because we've learned a lot what you have to do. So um, just want to say thank you. And I hope I wasn't talking too fast. I tend to do that. <laughs> but uh, And this is just um, this image you might kind of wonder a little bit about. But we were involved with a, um, an art group who were um, looking at different food uh, dishes um, and, and kind of looking at the amount of waste that are linked to food food um, dishes. And uh, here you have a, a typical pasta dish and uh, here you have the waste that you have for that dish. Thank you. Thanks very much, anne Katrin. Thank you for uh, lovely ideas that, that you've brought to us, including the one for the bins where you can get some exercise at the same time. So thank you so much for that. I'm sure that there might be some questions and we'll have a look at those at the end. Thank you. Our next speaker is going to be Helen Lockhart from Two Oceans. Um, Helen, over to you. Thanks very much, Judy. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's go here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, okay, but we can see your your yes. list of. No, that's all good. Okay. okay from start. <laughs> Thanks very much, Judy. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this webinar. It's um, very exciting also just to hear about what's happening internationally. Um, I'm Helen Lockhart uh, from the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town, and I'm the Communications and Sustainability Manager here at, at the Aquarium. 
So here at the Two Oceans Aquarium, uh, we know firsthand the impact of plastic pollution on marine animals. Okay, and is your slide supposed to be showing? Yes. Okay, because we've got your file, your list of files. Okay, sorry about that. Let me just... Uh, just close. Oh, I'm just going to go in again. Sorry about this. No problem, it'll pop up. Worked perfectly at our practice session on Wednesday. I know. That's always there Murphy's law, isn't it? There we go. Can you see that now? Great. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the introduction again. Um, but basically, so this is Bob. He is a green turtle that uh, came to us in 2014. He was weak and he was dying and in a very, very bad um, state. Um, we obviously didn't know what was um, wrong with him besides the external injuries that he presented. But three months later, he... Okay, I'm not having any luck here. There we go. Three months later, he pooped out, excreted all of this plastic, bits of balloon, and even bits of balloon string attached to the, the bits of balloon. And this caused some serious damage to Bob. Um, he's still with us in our rehab facility. And um, we are obviously working towards releasing him back into the ocean. But he's been an incredible ambassador um, for plastic pollution in the ocean and raising awareness and um, really drawing attention to the impact that it has on marine animals. Our plastic journey actually started way back in 2010 um, when we were approached by a young and uh, upcoming artist named um, Simon Bannister who created this exhibit called Plasticos. And basically he, he created uh, various marine creatures. This was a sea dragon out of reclaimed plastic that he'd found along the roadsides um, and off dumps. And we had several exhibits that went into the aquarium. And at the same time as that, um, in 2010, we were visited by the Five Gyres crew. Um, the Five Gyres Institute is based in the US, but they, they arrived in Cape Town having completed a trawl um, across the South Atlantic Ocean. And their visit and this exhibit really, really inspired us and motivated us to start our plastic uh, reduction journey. So in 2011, uh, we started our journey for serious, uh, you know, seriously, and it actually started with one of our staff, uh, Haley McClellan, who launched in her personal capacity something called Rethink the Bag. And this campaign was about um, ridding South Africa of the plastic bag um, shopping, the plastic shopping bag, trying to get South Africa to be a plastic bag free uh, country. So we banned balloons and plastic bags from the aquarium. And then in 2013, we actually appointed her as a dedicated environmental campaigner because she was so passionate about this campaign. So we gave her full reins and um, said to her, focus on Rethink the Bag as your full-time job. We also gave her some other campaigns to run with, including Balloon Busters, Tap In, which was about getting people to move away from plastic um, bottled water, Straws Suck, bin your butts and cut a loop. So cut a loop was basically anything that forms a loop around packaging, um, box bands, um, uh, basically encouraging people to, to cut the loops. And then in 2017, we again did a workshop with staff and um, really committed ourselves to a plastic pollution and plastic awareness as one of our key sustainability focus areas. So this, although our plastic journey really started in, in 2010, we actually started with um, an eco-label certification back in 2007. This is a, a local um, eco-label um, by the Heritage Environmental Rating Program. And um, it's based on ISO 14,000. So it's, it's pretty robust, but as I say, it is very much a South African label. And then we looked at... Um, 
we appointed a waste management service provider and we have our own on-site um, waste sorting facility. We published a waste management and procurement policies as part of our environmental management system. We've introduced waste separation bins in our public and staff areas. And I did, I liked your comment about too many bins and areas. Um, and Katrine, that's something that we can definitely look at. But we, you know, each area has their own recycling bins, so plastic, um, glass, et cetera, et cetera. We also encourage our staff and volunteers to bring their home recycling to their aquarium because in South Africa, we don't actually have um, a very robust recycling collection programs. Some of our areas, some of our suburbs, um, their recycling gets collected, but for the most part, you have to take your recycling to a specific um, waste drop-off area. So to make it really um, easy for our staff, we allow them or encourage them to bring to the aquarium. We also use recycled materials in all our arts and crafts for our, uh, in our children's play center. So just encouraging that mindset of reuse and, and um, recycling. And then we work very much with our suppliers in terms of asking them to supply in bulk and then also taking back containers. So for instance, um, some of the chemicals that we receive for some of our um, operations, we ask them to take back the, the containers so that they can reuse them or resupply to us. And then we work very closely with our tenants to reduce their single use plastic items and packaging. So we really only have two tenants. We have a restaurant on site and a shop. And um, the shop actually at one stage was really, um, had a lot of plastic packaging and a lot of plastic toys. And um, obviously those are easy sellers, but they've really done a lot to bring in um, so, you know, non-plastic non toys, non-plastic items, and really they've done a huge step um, in reducing their plastic uh, consumption. And then we use um, compostable bamboo or biodegradable packaging, coffee cups, um, cutlery for our functions and events and in our snack stops. Um, at the moment, our snack stops are closed in the aquarium because we don't allow eating and drinking in the aquarium because of COVID and people having to wear their masks. Um, so, and also our functions and events um, have obviously come to a grinding halt because also again, because of COVID restrictions as has happened in other places around the world. And then pre-COVID, we were using paper straws. Like other people have said, you know, paper straws or straws has been a, a tricky challenge because of, you know, thick milkshakes or, or slush puppies and, and that kind of thing. So that has been quite a challenge on that. We've switched from plastic water bottles to glass bottles for sale through our snack stops. And we also use jugs of water instead of bottled water. We use um, reusable get, um, bags and coffee cups as, as gifts for you know, our members or for corporate gifts. And then we very much partner with others working towards plastic reduction and plastic awareness. Um, so NPOs and, and retailers a, a across the board. And then we also assist with research. So our, our beach cleanups, during the beach cleanups, the, the data that we collect is, is um, added to uh, research that's being done by the universities. We've also been uh, played a pivotal role with our owners, the VNA Waterfront. And um, through, through our influence, um, we managed, they have actually committed um, to becoming a single, um, single use plastic free property. Uh, it's very much a work in progress, but they are very seriously dedicated to, to this. So it's been amazing to see their journey uh, and them coming on board um, with their initiatives. And then obviously plastic awareness is huge um, in terms of everything that we do. So we talk about it at every single aspect uh, and opportunity. We have um, uh, you know, plastic messaging or plastic pollution messaging in our exhibits, um, feed talk presentations, puppet shows, outreach programs, education programs and publications. We speak to schools, communities, government, retailers. We um, participate in Plastic Free July, um, we host about four, four to six beach cleanups um, throughout the year. And then obviously sharing all our stories with the media because not only does this increase public awareness, but it's also great 
exposure for us and also to show that we are a purpose driven organization and how it aligns very much with our vision and mission. And then our, our marketing campaigns also include a plastic focus. This is actually part of our current uh, campaign where we're talking about ocean superheroes and ocean villains. And you can see the plastic bag is, is the ocean villain. In terms of things that we wish we'd known when we started the journey, I think staff buy-in is critical. And how you go about getting this from your staff can actually make or break your efforts. I think in the beginning, we kind of made the decision just outright to ban plastic bags um, from the premises without getting staff buy-in. And um, we were also a little bit too evangelical. We kind of thought that everybody would think like we, we did and would want the same things as we did. So really important to, to work with your staff and to get them on board. I think also the importance of getting one's own house in order before you start preaching to your visitors, because the minute the visitors pick on something that you're, you know, that, that doesn't align with what you're talking about, they will definitely call you out. So we kind of did it, you know, back to front almost. Um, so really important. And then in terms of your tenants, um, to, to start off from scratch, build in a green lease so that they know what to expect right from the start with, um, with you know, in terms of what, what you expect from them uh, in terms of plastic. And yeah, I mean, I think we're really fortunate now in that there's a tsunami of information about plastic um, pollution, plastic awareness has, has risen incredibly since, you know, when we first started on it. And so many people are doing really good things. So I think if there was any, any a good time to start now is definitely it. So thank you very much for allowing us to share our journey with you. Thank you very much, Helen, and, and really interesting to see your journey and just to show that it doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And I think that that sometimes we want big, quick results, but it does take time. So, so well done to you and to Oceans. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marcus Tay. He's from Wildlife Reserve Singapore. So Marcus, over to you. Marcus, you're still on mute. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see my screen finally. Yes, all good. Thank you. All right. Um, yes, so good day to everyone. It's uh, evening on my side. So we're very happy to share our experience from uh, Wildlife Reserves Singapore. So first up, um, I mean, one of the main focus of the Waza Plastic Commitments was actually about plastic bags. So what we have chosen to do was, on f &B side, we replaced plastic bags with uh, Conwear bags. But in many other places, in the retail especially, we promoted it, the sale of the reusable shopping bags, like the second one in the picture you can see. And next, we also started selling the non-woven bags, whereby the proceeds from non-woven bags actually goes towards our regional wildlife conservation efforts. So we did a tally, I think this was in 2018-2019, on a yearly basis, way before COVID, um, just getting people to pay for bags. And we have an effective reduction in 50% uh, of the bags. And that's looking at about 3.6 tons of uh, packaging material, roughly equivalent to the weight of one Asian male elephant. So that, that was on uh, plastic bags. And the other big thing about Waza commitment, of course, was the single-use plastic water bottles. What we chose to do was that in our existing parks, uh, I think we installed about 27 water dispensers, like the one you can see, and, and they are actually pretty um, popular families for the ease of use. Of course, we heavily promoted the use of uh, reusable bottles with our partners, and we actually provided this option, carton water, as a way for those people who did not bring their bottles and do not feel like buying a new reusable bottles. So with that, based on the previous comparison with plastic bottles that we used to sell, we, we estimate we reduce about 13 tons of um, packaging materials, and that's about three Asian elephant meals, three male Asian elephants. And things to these efforts, I think Waza is Plastic Commitment is one of the ones we signed up to, but we also had a World Life Fund, WWF uh, Plastic Action, that is very Singapore-centric. And I just want to bring your attention to the graph so you can see that um, we, we have to remove um, plastics from the consumer chains under Waza Commitments. And the last, the row right at the bottom actually shows that for many of the different items, whether it's single-use cups, um, 
even packaging source packaging for sources, we've actually managed to eliminate the plastics uh, options. Yes, the only ones we still we did back then in twenty twenty we didn't hide, find a solution for was actually um, plastic cups covers, and thanks to these efforts, we were actually awarded um, the Singapore Packaging Agreement Awards by uh, the National Environment Agency of Singapore. So very interestingly, while I do say that we one of uh, the things we did to remove plastic water bottles was the use of carton water. But I think with time, we do realize, I think we may be substituting one devil with the other devil. Um, we have been replacing single-use plastics with other kinds of biodegradable materials or paper related, or in this case, carton water. And if you look at the breakdown of um, carton water, well, 75% of it is definitely paper. I think a good 25% is about this poly alum layer, which is plastics and aluminum. And, and we do not know how long does this aluminum last in the oceans. That's one. But more interestingly is that locally, I'm not sure about in your countries, but locally, there are very limited recycling facilities for carton or used beverage carton. And we have to send them to Malaysia. I think we, we have come to realize that we will try we are not there yet, but we are looking at perhaps we don't sell any packaged water and move towards 100% reusable packaging. And some other attractions have done so, right? Just like you can see here, the Tivoli cups or the Olin Zoos again and again cup. Perhaps even more interestingly is the WWF Pact actually suggested that the second proposed solution is actually to procure recycled PET bottles. But we'll keep that in mind. But I think I want to leave everybody with this last statement from WWF is that while well, beverage cartons have a place, especially for flavored drinks to retain the flavor, we really should not use it as a replacement for drinking plastic bottles, simply to accommodate visitors' demand for plastic removal. Just pure plastic phobia, and we just simply replace one disposal option with another disposal option and not really creating any real solution. Yep, so I think with that, that's our lesson. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. And I think that you've raised a really important point that so often we, we think we're solving a problem, but instead creating a different sort of a problem. So I think that that's an important thing for us to explore a little later as we get into the questions. And now we're gonna head all the way across the world to Houston Zoo and Renee, over to you. Thank you so much. Let me just put this in presentation mode and we are on track. There we go. A warm hello from the US and specifically Texas. Um, so glad to see everyone here. Uh, we have had an exciting journey um, in the plastic reduction realm. Um, and all thanks to my buddy here or on the screen that you're seeing, um, this is our key to success. So the zoo actually rescues about 100 sea turtles per year, provides medical care for all the Texas coast, injured and stranded um, sea turtles. So this gave us a really good uh, connection that all of our audiences are very excited about the wildlife. And we really dove into that with staff, with board, with um, volunteers, with our external audience, really utilizing um, the wildlife to tell that story and explain to people that they would be saving the wildlife, reducing that threat, and that was the key to our success. In 2015, um, I worked with the our, um, people that do our gift shop, so we also have concessionaires, and had them come and see the turtles when they would come into the um, clinic, the veterinary clinic. And really I wanted them to be able to decide that this was something that they wanted to do because it was a difficult switch for them to, to move away from plastic bags. More for, because remembering that Houston is a petroleum city. This is a very big plastic city here. Um, so we were in a very different environment and I had to be sensitive to the fact that all the audiences, although they were really connected to wildlife, they really didn't know how to be able to tell people um, about you know reducing single-use plastics. Um, so we used this and uh, the, the concessionaire manager came with me a few times. She brought her staff and she came to it herself. She saw some entanglement um, related cases. She saw some ingestion cases, much like our friends were talking about Bob. 
And it made her conviction, conviction so much stronger. So what we've learned is that all of the audiences have to have this themselves, not just us telling them to reduce the plastic, it's how they can do it themselves. And we had some great success. So basically, but we had to be so supportive of them after. So once that manager decided that we would go plastic bag free, I gave her all the support she needed for her staff and made sure that our social media folks were telling all of our guests before they came to the zoo that we would be saving sea turtles by them not having this plastic bags and that there'd be alternatives uh, available. I think it's setting everyone up for success and really seeing that whole team effort um, come together. But it was a very important thing to connect it to the thing that all of our audiences love, the wildlife. And as you can see, we've done some great things since then. Since 2018, we've been single use plastic straw bag and bottle free, which has saved um, 80,000 plastic bags, 300,000 plastic bottles, and 23,000 plastic straws from ending up in the waste streams. We do share this with all of our audiences as well, because I think it's so important to share those successes as you go. Make sure people don't feel that this is hopeless and just keep showing these very good stories of what's going on. We did connect, as you can see, every piece that we would show to this um, single use plastic issue, we would connect to the wildlife. And we saw that that was the most traction that you could have. Of course, our audiences are here for the wildlife. So make sure that, make, that keeps in the conversation. Even you can see the refilling stations. That was something so important. Save sea turtles right here by filling up your water bottles. So powerful for our audience to see and really practicing that behavior on grounds, which we know needs to happen in order for that to continue and for them to be the advocates out there when people are looking at them strangely in a petroleum city going, I'm not gonna use those plastic bags when I shop. Uh, really arming them as conservationists and helping them. We did a bar um, campaign for the, the straw um, once as, as the previous speaker had talked about, um, we had gone straw free, then we tried to help people in the city to go straw free. We've also helped people in the city go plastic bottle free. Um, a lot of different things. Now we do have a carton situation when we shifted from, to plastic from plastic water bottles to reusable water bottles and cartons because we had, we're in Houston, very hot, a million dollars in um, water bottle sales per summer. So big negotiation with the concessionaires. They had it in their hearts. They knew why they were doing it. So they made the moves and we helped them with the research. But we did have to go with a carton um, solution for a while with the idea that we would slowly try to work towards having reusable options. One thing I will point out, the reusable option, um, this water bottle, people perceive it to be dirty if it's on the shelf in the US. So what you need to do is pre-fill those water bottles. If you're going to go into this, pre-filling those water bottles and selling them with the water in it makes people get through that barrier of uh, it being um, dirty uh, off of the shelf. So that was just one little thing we saw in all of this. Of course, this helped with our external um, identity changing to the goals and the mission of the zoo. Everyone was starting to understand. We even do have petroleum executives on our board. They started to understand because it was connected to the sea turtle, it was less, um, it seemed to be less conflict ridden to them. If you're not going on the environmental kind of um, chain, it really helps to diffuse it a little and have people feel that they can join the wildlife saving journey. That's what people want. They want to join the team, you know, to, to help animals, uh, especially our audiences we already have. We really worked for the internal audience to get them there first. So we did use Plastic Free July. It's a great tool to get everyone engaged and get them feeling like they could contribute somehow. We didn't put any limitations on Plastic Free July. We let them think about the single use plastics that they were facing in their departments. What things could they do? And you see there's like the warehouse figured out to recycle the plastic straps from the boxes. But what this did was get us into a mentality 
And that is the most important thing. It's that thinking that you wanna shift your whole culture to in order to support this as we go through challenges like last year. We didn't have any back steps because everyone was thinking about how to move forward with the identity they had now taken on, which was reduction, uh, repurposing everything. So for an example, our PPE, the, the masks and the, the um, gloves that were used, there were, we figured out how to recycle them, how to get them to places and make sure that we didn't uh, you know, contribute to the waste streams that way. So that was all already, people were thinking that way. They wanted it in their departments, they're championing it. So this is such an important step, I will tell you, and, and the previous speaker also talked about that, that internal buy-in so that you're not, one department isn't the one kind of guiding this and um, making sure that you're the only champion. Um, actually this year, I'm just gonna um, uh, talk about one success. These have obviously been at past successes, beginning toothbrush recycling, latex glove, um, uh, mask recycling, reducing single-use bags and containers for diets, anything that they had. But this year, the aquarium and the grounds team have decided to recycle cigarette butts, and they figured out how to do that and um, will now do that for the zoo in the future. And that'll be more internal because we don't allow smoking on grounds. But it's important that the staff all see every operation of the zoo this way. And this is just great evidence that they've really taken it into their own identity. And then we come to the where we are now with the zoo. In 2022, we will have the new Galapagos exhibit opening at the Houston Zoo. And this is focused on plastic reduction. Now we've prepared all of our internal staff. Our board members even can, um, are doing Plastic Free July with us. Um, we also have our conservation partners working on Plastic Free July this July. Our partners in um, Galapagos are actually working um, on in our campaign with us and doing Plastic Free July there while we're doing Plastic Free July here. Another chance for staff to connect with what we're doing in Galapagos, but also for Galapagos to understand why the zoo's here, why it has an exhibit, and what's that going to do for the wildlife that they love and we share. So this is what's really exciting. And as we move forward, it's obviously that we've learned so much from our journey that's gonna go into this exhibit and then have that ability for people to practice the behaviors on grounds, which we know is the key. Um, we have all, other, uh, other, um, all of our other stuff that we sell on grounds is all compostable as well. But please um, take a look at that guide. And if you do have any questions, all of our contact information is in there. And just keep moving forward and celebrate your successes. Help the, the, your audiences feel like they're champions in this and you're gonna see that movement forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renan. It was really, really inspiring. And I think that that key of, of connecting people with the animals as being the sort of foundation for everything, I think is so great. And then, and then, yeah, bringing it on from there into all the departments. So that was super, thank you so much. And now we move over to our last speaker, definitely last but not least, Wolfgang, over to you from Tenerife. Uh, Gav, could you share the presentation, please? Okay, thank you, Gabriel. So hello, everybody. Uh, the world is currently suffering from three major global crises, which are related to each other. We know them all. It's the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the global pandemic. And uh, with this in mind, as a wildlife conservation officer of Loro Park, I would like to give you an insight into the plastic policy at Loro Park. Next, please. As a modern zoo, Loro Park, so, sorry, the one before. Okay, thank you. As a modern zoo, Loro Park is an important animal embassy and is an effective link to nature. And this in mind, uh, and we welcome more than 1 million visitors every year. And with this in mind, we have the responsibility to play a great role and we have a model function in environmental protection. And that's uh, why we had to propose a change and we have been able since 2018 to eliminate more than 
50 tons of plastic and we are just in the beginning we can become better next please uh, this is what we uh, uh, have been shown before these are the elements uh, which are uh, given to the customers and which can be replaced by uh, environmental responsible materials we discussed this uh, already okay next please uh, but these are not only the customers uh, we have also have to have a look we must also have a look uh, at the suppliers you know uh, because uh, so we uh, made it possible that all the packages we get uh, like uh, uh, packages of for products for floor and dishwash, uh, dishwasher cleaners are returned to the suppliers. And so almost uh, we can save ton two tons of plastic waste every year. And uh, this goes back into the value chain and does not end up in landfill. And we saw with the turtles, for example, how important this is uh, for biodiversity. But unfortunately, the total elimination of plastic use is not possible yet. We just discussed uh, that there are things uh, about uh, hygienic uh, problems. Uh, we cannot avoid generating plastic for sanitary protection, for example. But the reusable uh, uh, glass, for example, might be very interesting. And what we also do not control yet completely is uh, which kind of plastic, which kind of packages we receive with, with our products. And so we must go on uh, making more good influence to the society. Next, please. Laura Park, I just uh, said it, uh, began to reduce single-use plastic in April 2018 and to implement the waste hierarchy, avoid, reduce, recycle, and dispose. But uh, I was asked uh, to, to speak about also things we wished uh, we had known before. And so uh, I must tell you, we didn't know that uh, the past would be uh, not, not a light one. Because especially uh, with, the, uh, with the position on an island, on a beautiful island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it's not always uh, 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 a slight uh, possibility to get uh, the the material we need from the island and uh, so we have to import a lot from the continent uh, from spain from italy and from from other countries for example uh, the refillable water bottles we have here one uh, uh, we have to get from the continent but on the other hand we are an institution which is an important an economic factor on the canary island and so we can also provide impetus for more environmental sensitivity and for innovations in the industry, in the local industry. Next, please. For me as a wildlife conservation officer, the last chapter is, it might be the most important one. Uh, we have to work on social awareness uh, because we are uh, an example for so many visitors. And so Laura Park and Laura Park Foundation, our environmental uh, foundation, uh, we work together for the protection of biodiversity. And so in the end, we uh, offer uh, education programs. Uh, we, uh, we organize beach cleaning uh, campaigns. And uh, in the end, the, the garbage, which uh, is found by the people taking part, especially the children taking part in the beach cleaning campaigns, we have been able to uh, turn uh, these plastics into sculptures which are inspired by the illustrious uh, painter, Canarian painter Nestor Martin Fernandez de la Torre. And uh, we made these sculptures public to, to sensitize uh, the, uh, 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 the, the people all around in the island and also the tourists who are coming a lot to the Canarian Islands. And so uh, in the end, there is, we begun good work. We have been able to reduce uh, 40 tons uh, of, uh, of uh, single-use plastic, but we are just in the beginning of the journey and uh, it's good to, uh, to, to speak to all to, of you and to, to get all your ideas. And so it's great to see you and thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Wolfgang. And I think that you gave us a really interesting perspective of being on an island where everything has to come in and go out. So you've got a, a very interesting example of a circular economy. So that was a very useful perspective there. Thank you. Right, I firstly a very big thank you. All of our speakers have stuck to their time. So we have a little bit of time for question. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I know that there were one or two questions that popped up in the chat. Some of them have been answered and some haven't. Um, the one question that I did see, where, where was it? Oh, here we go. Um, which department or section in your organization is responsible? So I think that some of you come from conservation departments, some of you come from other areas. So maybe just a, a quick a quick ask of, of anybody, which department is responsible? And then I would like to add, how do you really inspire your whole team to, to come on board? Who'd like um, to go I, first? I, I can go. Um, we have... Uh, now, so in um, 2015, I was able to establish a sustainability position, um, but tried to make it more of a facilitator so that no one felt like it was that person's job to do this. We actually gave titles to a lot of the different staff in the different departments that had that sort of champion. They definitely had that spirit in them of, of plastic reduction. And we awarded them with these subtitles to their own um, their own um, titles themselves that gave them the empowerment to speak and champion everything. And so then we would have these groups with the staff to try and make sure they were empowered to give them all the tools they needed in order to implement. Um, but now I've shifted that um, sustainability position into the operations department because that is where the, all the planning's going in. They can really help with all the research. And so I knew that that was gonna be where it fit the best, but first establishing that no one pushes it off on that one department, that it is owned by everyone before, and then uh, putting it into that uh, operations piece. I think that that's a valuable point is that it's not because otherwise everything gets done by that person. And if it doesn't work, it's that person's fault. Yeah, good point. Anyone else like to contribute to that, that answer? Yes, and Katrine would like to do that. <laughs> Hi, so um, here in Copenhagen, it's um, the sustainability team is actually um, spread over more departments as well. We have the conservation department, we have an environmental department, and we have the uh, operational department, as well as the marketing, because the sale and marketing are also getting all the deals with, uh, with all the, um, with the clients. And um, so, so we are a mix uh, of, uh, of departments. And we all have to share, you know, the load of it. But the funny thing was that when we started looking at how much we use of these different products, that, uh, that a kind of um, competitive element came into it because, for example, the warehouse, they really wanted to find a good solution. So they really went into it really eagerly. And, and it's, um, it, it became like a competition. So, and I think when you have the competition element in, in your team, then it, it makes it uh, much more fun. And then you actually really find solutions and funny solutions. And uh, so it's, um, it's, 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 it's a joint effort. Uh, and I think that's the only way that you can work it. Um, so yeah, that's how we deal with it. Great, and I love that idea of competition because that's what we found in our organization certainly helped to get a bit of the action going when it became a little bit of a competition. That's great. Anyone else have anyone to anything to add to that before we go on to the next question? Helen, yes? Yeah, so here at the church in Zakrim, um, I kind of started in the position of sustainability manager attached to my communications manager position and portfolio. And in the beginning, it was it was really difficult because I did feel quite um, on my own in terms of um, helping staff to you know um, get on board. But I think, and what I said earlier, I think the animals have really done the inspiration work. They're the ones who have inspired the staff um, again, just seeing that firsthand, not only turtles, but seals, we do a lot of disentanglement work with seals. Um, we've had seabirds that have had, you know, um, plastic bags and all sorts of things tied around their legs. So they're the ones that have inspired the staff. Um, you know, there have been some individuals, but basically it's, it's seeing, seeing and experiencing it firsthand. Is, and that's what Renee was saying, you know, get the people in to experience it firsthand and, and then they, they don't turn around and then they want to support. So 
now it's easy because everybody is a member of the sustainability department right throughout the whole company it's not just a single individual that's great thanks thanks helen um marcus so you got a yeah. response before we move on yes thank you so much for that um so so for us i think other than the water dispensers that was very much driven by our sustainability department for very much of it, um, the, our sustainability department probably comes out of the guidelines, but it's really the hard work of our procurement, retail, and F&B that did the changes. And I think we try to integrate that further, but because now we have a um, sustainable operations working group and having a sustainability module within the HR training. So in that sense, uh, we are trying to make sure the departments own as much as it as, uh, and drive it as much as possible. And the sustainability department just tries to guide or advise. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point, making it part of your HR, making it part of your induction, which I think is, is a, great, a great idea. I've got another question here um, that talks about the money side of it. So where the reduction of plastic has involved a change in a commercial product, so the loss of, of selling bottles, do the speakers have any details of the impact of the sales on income before you make the switch? Or how do you persuade somebody to say you're going to lose a million dollars of income um, if you make the switch which doesn't sound like a really good deal so so how do you work on the, the financial side any any tips from anybody on that one we had we had that very case um obviously we have about two million people that come through the zoo so water bottle sales were very high for our concessionaire um, it did help that they wanted to make the change again back to helen's point you put it in their hearts, they figure out the way and you're not telling them what to do. Um, they figured out what carton they'd be comfortable with. They figured out what bottle they wanted to do. We did all the imagery for them. We did everything to set them up for success. But I think that's what you really have to reinforce them with is we're going to put out press about how incredible you are. We're going to put send guests your way because they're going to feel like they want to save wildlife in your concession airs and just really work with them to build them to be able to make those jumps. Now, the carton water didn't it didn't actually see too much of a decline in um, that uh, income because people were still using it a lot. They did use the water bottles and they were still getting a good income from that water bottle. So it's just having a lot of discussions, but also supporting just be a huge support and don't shame because as soon as you start shaming that's when they'll start going the other way <laughs> yeah valid valid point don't don't shame because i think that sometimes we come as as helen said you've come a little bit evangelical and then if you don't all believe what what we think then you're wrong and i think that that's sometimes a, a challenge any anyone else got the the financial side sorted or got some solutions on the financial side Okay, I'll move on to the, the last the last question, which is always a good one. How do you track and monitor the progress and reduction, um, successes in reduction? And I think that Anne Katrin had some examples. She's got to, to dash off and leave us. But anyone else want to share your, your tracking tools? Because some of the figures you presented are really powerful and I think that they can be inspirational. How do you keep those tracking, tracking going? We actually helped our concessionaires to do it. So they did the tracking themselves, then we could celebrate their success. I think it is a really key thing, that tracking, because they can celebrate there's 80,000 less um, plastic bags in the landfill, therefore they're saving sea turtles. So, but having them understand how to do it with you, we used, um, we, we did work very closely with them, but we figured out very simple tracking systems that they could do. Um, and then just made sure that we could uh, also put that out to the public. So showing them as the successors, really sharing there, they can share that with all of their world of all the other concessionaires in different zoos. Um, and it was just a nice way to, again, a collaboration, uh, giving them the tools to do it. Yep, that's, that's it. I think making it easy too is, is important. So the tracking needs to be relatively simple. Anyone else want to add to that question? Because that's the last question that we're going to have time for, Marcus. Yeah, I think I will share because um, thanks to our application for all the awards, we had to do a lot of tracking. Yeah. 
So, so really it was, it wasn't that difficult. It was really going, working with, uh, for example, f &B, just to check how much were they selling last year and how much are we selling these years. I think we only did that for a few items that we really wanted to report on, like such as the bags and the plastic bottles. For the rest, we actually had um, WWF packs to give us the various categories. So every year we had to kind of report uh, the progress we are making. So I think that was a more like visual check, but we don't quantify the amount. But I do think you can easily quantify the amount through the amount you procure as uh, raw materials by your f and for example. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Marcus. And I think that that brings us to the end of our webinar. We've now three minutes after four o'clock. So thank you so much to, to all of you. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who attended. We had just on a hundred people with us which is amazing. That, that's a really great turnout. Um, we have put in the chat the link to the guide. So please, if you're one of the people that hasn't seen the guide yet, please download the guide. And hopefully during this webinar, we've helped those of you who were planning to use it. And we've just given you a, a few tips on how you can really start to use it. And just start. I think that that's often taking the first step is the most difficult. And we've written the guide with lots of examples, just like you've heard today. So lots of practical examples. Uh, we've got lots of, of simple checklists in that guide that you can use. So it really is a, a beginner's guide just to, to getting going because that's that's the first step. So the, the list is, the link is in the chat and then just to, to welcome all of you to our next webinar, which will probably on, be on sustainable forestry. So we look forward to that one. Thank you, Elaine. We're looking forward to the next one. Then you'll probably have one on palm oil. And then somebody mentioned the sustainable development goals. We'll also have a webinar on that. So we've got an exciting set of, of webinars coming up. So from me, a big thank you to all of you. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Gavin Martin and the Waza team. Thank you so much, everybody. And to end off, as we're all leaving, we're just going to show a quick video for those of you who've got another couple of, of minutes just to watch. Um, but the webinar is now officially over. And thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you. Every year, at least 8 million tons of plastic is dumped into the ocean, sadly killing millions of animals each year, both on land and at sea. Worldwide, only 10 to 13 percent of plastic items are ever recycled. Only 9% of the 9 billion tons of plastic the world has ever produced has been recycled. While recycling helps to ease the problems of plastic pollution somewhat, it is only a drop in the ocean. We all need to use less plastic and move towards more environmentally sustainable products and behaviours. The United Nations Environment Programme views the use of single-use plastics as one of the biggest environmental scourges of our time, and the World Zoo and Aquarium community has decided to act. In October 2017, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the United Nations Environment Programme. One of the goals of that memorandum is a commitment from both organizations to tackle plastic pollution. To support our members, a short guide, how to reduce single-use plastic at your zoo or aquarium has been produced. This guide aims to help your organization implement the policies and changes needed to reduce the use of single-use plastic. Regardless of the location, the size, or the budget of your zoo or aquarium, this guide contains simple steps and examples to help you start changing the way your organization thinks about, offers, and uses some of the most common single-use plastic items. Waza friends and colleagues, please download the Waza Plastics Guide. 
share it with your teams and support them to use it because together we can make a difference for our ocean, for our planet and for the many animals that we love so much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gav, and bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take Thanks, care, everyone. Judy. We're very grateful for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.